I'm going to do a two-part message between this week and next week, and I've titled it, Who Touched Me? Who Touched Me? And this is part one of Who Touched Me? And my subtitle for this is Those Who Take From Us. Those Who Take From Us. I was preparing this message really as part of uh, the principles of gathering, and uh, so a couple of weeks ago I started uh, developing it, but uh, I just felt it didn't fit into the series properly, so I determined that I would uh, do it a little separately. So it's still under the theme of gathering, uh, but uh, a little differently. And, and we're going to look at a very popular scripture, very familiar, uh, and most of the time uh, we preach from it and look at it uh, as a story of faith and how to receive from God, and of course myself, I've preached on that uh, from that perspective, but I'm going to look at that verse a little differently, not in the traditional way we've looked at the verse, and we're going to look at uh, the story of the woman with the issue of blood, and today we'll focus on him, and next week we'll focus on Jesus, and we're going to look at the, this interface between the woman and Jesus, and a couple of things that I believe we should all learn from it. So, uh, we're going to look at it <clears throat> a little differently. Mark's gospel and chapter number 5 and verses 25 to 31. Mark chapter 5, 25 to 31. Now a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years and has suffered many things from many physicians. She has spent all that she had and was no better but grew, but rather grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, You see the multitude thronging you, and you say, Who touched me? And, uh, and we know the rest of the story. The woman came up and confessed and, and declared that, uh, of course, she had been touched by Jesus. Now, the, usually, and, and rightly so, uh, we look at this verse or this passage and we see how to break through obstacles, press against resistance in order to touch Jesus and receive from him. And that is rightly so because the story speaks of that. But as I said, I will apply this a little differently uh, from the way it has been uh, seen traditionally. So let's start with a statement the woman made that tells us the motive behind her actions. She says, if only I may touch his clothes. She believed that touching the clothes of Jesus will solve a major problem that she had. Of course, Jesus had a reputation as a healer. Uh, his ministry uh, as a healer was very prominent. People knew him as somebody who healed people. And so this woman, based on the reputation of Jesus and based on what was going on in her life, I just said, if only I can touch the clothes of Jesus, I will be made well. So three things I want you to note. First is that this woman had a great need. She was in a very desperate condition. She was sick, and she was getting worse. And the Bible says that the sickness, this particular sickness, was draining blood from her. She was losing blood for 12 years. And that's not an easy thing 
to, to go through. And not only that, she was losing money. Because she, she, she'll go to the hospital or she'll be recommended for help and, and there will be no help. So by this time, not only has she lost a lot of blood, she's almost lost everything that she owned. So you would say that she has a great need and she is desperate. The second thing we would note about this woman is that she got close to Jesus. She determined to get close to Jesus. And in spite of all her weaknesses and the obstacles, she pressed to get close to Jesus. And she was thinking of getting close to Jesus in order to get help. She was not thinking of getting close to Jesus to serve Jesus. She was not thinking of getting close to Jesus to know more about Jesus. She wanted to get close to Jesus because that will solve her problem. It's a very interesting perspective of somebody wanting to get close to somebody else for her own benefit and not seeking anything for the person she wants to get close to. Third thing you would notice is that she had an agenda. So this is getting close with an agenda. She said to herself, if I touch the hem of his garment or his clothes, I shall be made whole. So every part of this agenda is aimed at the woman's well-being and not of Jesus. And in a sense, we can all identify with this woman. When you have a great need, and life is difficult, whatever that problem is, and you want to get help, you do everything you can to get help. And that's what she's doing here practically. And she wanted to touch the clothes of Jesus. It's a very strong desire. When a desperate and needy person gets to know where solution is, they do everything they can to get to where the solution is. So for example, uh, if you are rich or have some financial means and people are desperately in need, uh, sometimes they do everything possible to get close to you. In, in our part of, of, of the world, in Ghana, uh, if, if you are in a very advantaged position, whatever that advantaged position is, and people think you hold the solution to their problems, they don't care what it takes, they will get close to you. That's what this woman is doing. She has to get close to Jesus. She has to break through protocol and get close to Jesus. You know, sometimes for, for people who have money, uh, you wake up in the morning and uh, people have been lining up in front of your house since 3 a.m. because they, they, they believe that if they may but enter your house, they will be made whole. Even when we are a pastor, sometimes people believe that. If only I will come, a uh, pastor will pray for me, I'll be made whole. And they will do everything to get close to you. When I was a young pastor, I didn't know any better. Later, I changed the rules. But most times, people come to the house, sometimes midnight. And they will come with all kinds of problems, and, and they will come in the midnight, they will come and bang on your door, pastor, I need help, I need help, I need help. In the morning, people are in the house, and they don't care that you're married, they don't care that you have children, they don't care that you have needs, you don't care that you also need help. All they want is, if I may but touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. That's the agenda. It's not for you. Not for your well-being, it's so they can get healed. 
And so that's the angle I want to bring to this story. So what is a touch? When this woman says, if I can touch, what does she mean? A touch can mean two things. First, it means contact. It's a point of meeting. I need to meet this person. I need to meet Jesus Christ. So she wants to make contact. But not only contact, a touch also is a connection, a point of exchange. A connection means that something is going to leave somewhere to go somewhere. So this is the setup I want you to have in mind. Of course we know that she's acting in faith and of course we know that she later got healed. But for a moment just forget about all of that. This is somebody in desperate need who wants a solution. And as I look at this subject, especially in terms of gathering, you realize people who have spent time building uh, whatever they have built, maybe they've built wealth, maybe they've built a good reputation, maybe they've built uh, a profession, maybe they've built a business, maybe they've built a marriage, whatever, or they've built, whatever they've built, there are always people who think if I can get to that person, he or she will solve my problems. And their intention to get to you is to draw something from you to help them and never think about whether after you solve their problem, they will still have anything left. So let's look at what the woman did. Three things that she did. First, she acted secretly. She touched Jesus secretly. She moved quietly, unnoticed. No one paid attention to what she was doing. And she made a demand on Jesus without telling him what he, she was doing. So, here is Jesus, and somebody has an agenda to take from him without telling Jesus, I need help from you. You know, most times in the Bible, people who came to Jesus announced their need. Lord, I'm blind. Lord, help me. Lord, heal me. And then Jesus would heal them. This one didn't tell Jesus anything. She's coming secretly to draw. So that's the first thing we see that she's acting secretly. Second thing, she siphoned power from Jesus. She took from Jesus without asking permission. That's a serious thing. She drew power from Jesus. It cost Jesus. And it took something from Jesus, but she never asked permission. Forget about the fact that she got healed. But think about it. That somebody is taking from you without permission. It helps them, but they never had the courtesy to ask you for help. She siphoned power out of Jesus. Now I want you to think of this. What is happening at this time when this woman is on the scene? At this time, there is a man called Jairus. This man called Jairus came to Jesus and said to Jesus, my daughter is at the point of death. She is sick. Come and heal my daughter. So the reason why Jesus is on this journey is because a desperate father says, my daughter needs help. Come and help her. And Jesus is on the way to go and heal Jairus' daughter. This woman is not in the plan. 
I know for us who like buga buga things, this is very appealing because, you know, we want to take it by force. But I want you to think about it from more a human point of view. The agenda of Jesus, I'm going to Jairus' house, the daughter is desperately sick, she's on the point of death. Then this woman intrudes in this process, doesn't think about Jairus, doesn't think about Jairus' daughter. She just says, if I may but touch the hem of his garment, I may be made whole. So she comes through the crowd and she touches Jesus and Jesus stops. Now normally when we read the Bible, the, the, it could be a verse or a sentence, so we think it took two minutes. But when Jesus said, who touched me, I don't think it was a one minute thing. I'm sure it took some time, probably 30 minutes, trying to find out who touched me. And this conversation is going on. So Jesus has stopped. He's no longer going to Jairus' daughter's house. And the interesting thing is that whilst they were there debating who touched me, message came from Jairus' house that the woman, the girl, is dead. Of course, Jesus has unlimited power. So he still has power to go and heal Jairus' daughter. But I want you to imagine, what if this was a doctor? Somebody has come to get the doctor. My, 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 my child is sick. He packs medical bag, whatever they pack, and he's going to help the sick person. And then somebody interferes in the process. She treats the sick person with the medicine that is supposed to heal the other one, so this one gets healed and that one is not healed. Because it tells us sometimes that when people desperately need help, they become very insensitive to anything else. They don't care about anybody else. The third thing we notice, not only did she siphon power out of Jesus, this is the most serious, most serious grievance, if there is a grievance here. She silently withdrew after receiving from Jesus. The passage is very clear. It says, this woman touched Jesus. Of course, you say, if I may touch him, I may be healed. She touched Jesus. And immediately she felt that the fountain of blood had ceased. She knew she had been healed. But just as she approached Jesus silently, she walked away from Jesus silently. So she's coming to receive benefit and go without anything, without saying thank you, Jesus. I don't know about you, but I don't think that's a good behavior. I believe it is for that reason that Jesus asked, who touched me? Because Jesus felt, you can't just come and receive and go and not pause to say, Lord, thank you. She's just taking it Silently take, silently go. And as I thought about it, I think about the many people who get desperate and go to people for help, and after they get the help, never stop to say, thank you for helping me. The many people who would benefit from you, but never think that after I have found solution to my problem, I need to spend a minute to tell this person that although you didn't know I was in the crowd, you touched me. And I'm better because you touched me. She was about to leave without testifying. She was about 
to leave without telling the story. Can you imagine if Jesus had not asked, who touched me, this story would never occur in the Bible. Such a powerful testimony, but nobody will hear of it because this person decides, I will go in silently to take it and I will leave silently and I will not acknowledge anybody. Of course, Jesus affirmed her healing. He says, okay, go home. Your faith has made you whole. Anytime I read it, I said, you know, many times if you read such a story, you think Jesus should have said, should have. That's what I'm thinking. I'm not Jesus. But looking at the pattern of Jesus' treatment with people, remember the Syrophoenician woman who came to Jesus directly. Lord, help me. My daughter is at a point of death. And Jesus says we don't give the children's bread to dogs and so and so and so forth. And she said, Lord, even the dogs eat from the crumbs. Jesus said, I have never seen such faith. This is great. I've never seen anybody exhibit such faith. The centurion comes to Jesus. Lord, help me. Jesus says, I'll come to your home. He says, you don't even need to come to my home. Speak the word. My daughter will be healed. Jesus says, I've never seen such faith, such great faith. For this woman... There is no commendation of that nature. But what she had done should qualify to be called, I have never seen anything like that. But Jesus never. All he said is, you took it, you have it, go home. Your faith has made you whole, fine, you're happy, go. And I believe there is a rebuke there. Jesus did not withdraw the healing, but it was not the best way to approach somebody who helps you. Even if the person didn't know they have helped you, you know they helped you. You know, many times we think the end justifies the means. Once you got healed, that's all there is. But we have to also look at the process. Because sometimes you get results, but in getting the results, you break too many rules. You intrude into people's privacy. You hurt too many people, but you still get results. Can we just say, simply because she got results, we cannot examine the methodology No, we have to examine the methodology, although she got results. So what's the purpose of this message? (laughs) That sometimes when you have gathered so much in life, you've built so much, There are people who come to you, I call them takers. Jesus was anointed from from when he was in his mother's womb. John the Baptist leaped Uh, the first time the mother of Jesus met Elizabeth, mother of John the Baptist. Jesus was anointed. He's the son of God. He has the power of God without limit. But it doesn't mean you can take silently and leave silently. If you can take silently and live silently, Jesus would have been silent. But he says, who touched me? And tomorrow and next week, I'm going to talk about from Jesus' point of view. I'm dealing this from the woman's point of view. Jesus says, who touched me? Because I sense something left me. So what she did, it wasn't an innocent thing. It affected Jesus deeply, and Jesus felt it, and he could have kept quiet about it. It's like somebody who comes to you, and you give them maybe, maybe they think you are the richest person in Ghana, so you give them 100 CDs, 
and they don't even say thank you. Because in their mind, what is a hundred to you? You have so much power. You have so much money. I can silently take, I can silently leave because you will not feel it. But Jesus is saying, I felt it. I felt it. I felt it. And you can't run away thinking, I didn't feel it. I didn't feel it. I felt it. That's for next week. So what do takers do? First, they grab without permission. Unfortunately, sometimes they can grab till you get dry. <laughs> they will take and take and take and take till you are exhausted. And they will move silently. Some of you have helped people who took and took and took and took and took and took and you became dry and they moved on. I've always wondered, all these people, where were they when Jesus was on the cross? You took, 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 took. At the time Jesus needed you to show up, you left. You were not there. May it never be said of us that we are takers. And we take, 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 grab, 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 grab. And never stop to say, Thank you. Until we are prompted. You know, there are people who never say thank you until you prompt them. So this thing I gave you, you won't come and say thank you. Then they will say, oh, thank you. In fact, most of the time when they are saying thank you, they are insulting you in their head. This little thing you gave, thank you for what? Yeah, well, thank you for what? Okay, you want thank you. Okay, I thank you. <laughs> those who grab without permission and those who go into hiding after taking. So did Jesus ever touch you? Has God done something for you that you receive silently and have gone away silently without ever spending time to thank God? You remember the time when you were in trouble and you prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed, 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 oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God. And then it happened. Then silently. God didn't hear of you again. No prayer meeting. You don't go for all night. You don't, you don't go for dawn prayer meeting again. But when you needed help, dawn prayer meeting. Dawn, midnight prayer, noon prayer. You are praying, praying. Then God does it silently move. Until God prompts you and say, who touched me? Nobody hears your testimony. Some of you made promises to God. Lord, if you touch my life and do so and so for me, I will do such, such and such for you. He did it for you and silently you left. Of course, he would not take the miracle back from you. God will not bless you and take the blessing back. All he will say to you is, go. Your faith has made you well. So on second, go. <laughs> hey, you got it, go you couldn't even if you took silently at least can't you testify publicly without prompting you say well maybe she was feeling ashamed but the shame is gone he took away your shame the thing you were ashamed of, he has healed it. There is no shame again. Now there is joy. You can say, maybe there are too many people, and I, I don't want to speak publicly, but too many people, but you press through the people. Did it have to take Jesus to remind you that, hey, where's your testimony? Where's the story? Where's the honor? Where's the glory? And beyond Jesus, 
Are there people you've taken from? You are well now, but they don't know they helped you. They don't know that but for you or but for them, you would not be where you are. Are there people like that? Do you do that in this church? After service, you waylay people, if I may but touch them. I shall be made whole. And every Sunday after church, you get touched. And you are made whole, but you never stop to say, sir, thank you so much for, for touching my life. Without you, I wouldn't be where I am. My children would not have had education. I wouldn't have a testimony. Do you need to be prompted before you show appreciation? Are you one of those who plunder what people have gathered and never stop to say thank you? Well, that's what we learn from the woman with the issue of blood. We commend her faith, we commend her tenacity, but we disapprove of silent taking and silent going. <laughs> We disapprove of that. We disapprove. And may God never make us that. Silent takers and silently walk away. We can come boldly. Our faith is rewarded, but we must always pause to say thank you. Both to God and to the people who help us. Amen.